All right, we're, we're gonna start. Um, welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. This is our first hybrid uh, uh, Grand Rounds of the season, very exciting. Um, and we have a very special presentation today. Today is Dr. Scott Maniker from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, Scott is trained as a pulmonary uh, and critical care doc, and he's had a really interesting career. Um, he started off as a, uh, he has MD, PhD, as a physician scientist in neurosciences, uh, and he has demonstrated that the triple, actually the quadruple threat is still alive of a clinician, researcher, uh, educator, and now um, administration. Um, but what's really interesting about his career is, and I think an important point is that you can do it all, just not all at the same time. And so it's been a serial evolution of roles for Scott over time. And what I also found very enlightening talking to him last night over dinner is the fact that his role as an administrator has been the most impactful part of his career um, and has been the most influential. Um, and so I'm going to let Scott talk about all of his uh, various roles in compliance and regulatory domains. He really is one of the movers and shakers uh, in the field of medicine, not just in pulmonary, but throughout all, all of medicine. Uh, he's on, um, I will just point out the RUC committee for the AMA, which is you know, one of the most influential bodies to determining RVU um, uh, values, et cetera. Um, and so he really gives us a peek behind the curtain of how it's all happening. And more importantly, how we can best leverage um, the current rules and regulations to ensure that we are uh, documenting the work appropriately and getting credit for the complexity of the care that we're given, that we are give, giving, and that we are um, appropriately compensated for the work that we are giving. And it really is um, one of the core competencies that we should be training all of our um, residents, fellows, and faculty on that um, I would say that uh, none of us have ever gotten great training uh, as part of it. And it is an essential part of anybody's job, regardless of whether you're going into private practice or in academics. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Scott. Thank you, Lynn, thank you. So I'm assuming everybody can hear me. I stand before you today as a dinosaur here in this fourth stage of my career, looking at all you young people, and I'm relying on that row of chief residents to be interrupting me, throwing some food at me, and asking questions to make this more of a live and interactive experience, particularly for all of you on Zoom today. So uh, Lynn, thanks for that introduction. It has been tremendous actually seeing friends and making some new friends. And I look forward to continuing that through the day. Um, this is the disclosure slide that your CME office uh, asked me to insert. They wanted me to let you know uh, that I own some stock in 3M. I always disclose the 3M because as many of you may know, they own a claims processing subsidiary for hospital claims. So that's why I report it. Um, but I do a whole lot of other things that I also disclose that I want you to know about. Like I am a professional meeting goer. I go to way too many committees. I'm on the joint chest ATS uh, clinical practice committee. I'm an advisor to our office of billing compliance. I'm an advisor to CMS on a federal advisory commission, a hospital outpatient panel for hospital outpatient payments. And as Lynn mentioned, I'm on the RUC, the RVU update committee that makes recommendations to CMS on how many RVUs should be assigned to each CPT code. If you read about the RUC in the Washington Post or the New York Times, you'd think we're sitting in some smoke-filled back room price fixing the Medicare fee schedule. It's not actually true. I have an entirely separate one hour talk on the RUC and CPT process and how it does work, but that's a discussion and a talk for another day. Uh, I will say that for the RUC, I chair the practice expense committee. So if you recognize the physician fee schedule for, in the Medicare fee for service program is $100 billion, just under half of that flows through the recommendations from that practice expense committee. 
Similarly, I always give credit to my team. Tanji's our administrator, and I have four nurse coders, Carol, Mary, Sharon, and Annie. Uh, without their noses at the grindstone back home at the ranch, I couldn't be gallivanting around the country speaking with you yesterday and today. Here are some supplemental disclosures, like I was a consultant to RAND for a day in January of 2020. They had a contract with CMS to come up with a better method for allocating practice expense RVUs, not physician work RVUs for physician productivity. And since I run the practice expense committee, they asked me to be a member of their technical expert panel. And uh, it's my wife who owns the stock in Pfizer and J&J, &J, not I. All right, before we take a deep dive into the changes to the office visits, uh, I'm just gonna give you a little introduction to a combination of the construction of the Medicare physician fee schedule and some recent politics and things that you might have been noticing in the newspapers over the past two years. The way the physician fee schedule is constructed is you bill a CPT code and Medicare sends you a payment. You bill a CPT code and all the other payers send you a payment depending on your contract. And for the Medicare program, at least, that dollar payment is the sum total of all the RVUs, the work RVUs and the practice expense RVUs and the malpractice RVUs together multiplied by the conversion factor. And there was a 3% drop in the conversion factor this past year, which created havoc and chaos across the country. Why did the conversion factor drop? Why is there havoc and chaos in comp physician compensation plans uh, all across the country? Well, it dropped because remember, there's a fixed pool of dollars. And so the Medicare actuaries every year calculate the conversion factor as how many dollars they will pay for a CPT code, a service that uh, has exactly one RVU. It's the payment for an RVU. And the actuaries take each CPT code, add up the work practice expense malpractice RVUs for that CPT code, multiply it by the volume of expected CPT codes, and then they move on to the next code, and the next code through 7,000 active CPT codes and say, next year we have to pay X billion RVUs. How many dollars do we have available? Dollar, RVUs into the dollars gives you the payment for an RVU. Well, with the 25 to 30% increases in physician office visit payments in a fixed pool of dollars, if the office visits go up, the the payment per RVU has to go down, shifting money, literally billions of dollars into those physician office visits. So if you're a general internist, largely doing outpatient medicine with med a high proportion of Medicare fee for service, you're a winner. If you're a surgeon, radiologist, pathologist, emergency room physician, gastroenterologist, not doing that many outpatient office visits for Medicare fee-for-service, your pay went down 3%. So you'll hear lots of complaints about this from physician specialties that don't see large numbers of office visits. And the private payers are all over the place as to whether or not they're increasing payments. Most of them are not. So if you're running a practice plan, suddenly you have more RVUs, what are you gonna do with the productivity expectations? And you're not getting more dollars, you might get more dollars for those office visits, but everything else went down 3%. So that's, that's the explanation. Now, here are those 25 to 30% increases that are associated with the new documentation guidelines, which we're gonna spend most of the hour talking about. And let's just focus on 99214, the moderate level office visit, you can see the RVUs went up almost 30%. And similarly, the payment went up. Well, if you remember, President Trump delayed signing that bill from Congress until late December that put an additional $3 billion into the physician fee schedule. Where, are those, where did those $3 billion go? 99214. In calendar 2019, there were 110 million 99214s times $21 increase per office visit is just under two and a half billion of those $3 billion. And the remainder went into the similarly 25 to 30% increase in RVUs and payments for the 99213 low complexity and the 99215 high complexity office visits. 
That, that's where the $3 billion went. Okay, what were the principles or the guidelines that we're gonna spend the remainder of the hour talking about? Number one, decrease the administrative burdens because trying to fulfill the old documentation requirements is what you young people all grew up with, but us old dinosaurs actually remember what it was like taking care of patients in the 1980s and the early 1990s before the last 25 years of utter nonsense. And uh, it, was, it was really trying to go back to the future. Uh, decrease the need for audits, ensure the payment is resource-based because that's what the law requires, that it has to be through the relative value system. Decrease the unnecessary documentation, the note bloat, and there was no goal, there was no intention to shift money from proceduralists to general internists, family practitioners, and other primary care purveyors. In fact, I can tell you the goal was specifically to keep coding levels the same, the distribution of dollars the same. And why can I tell you that? I can tell you that because there was a committee of 12 who came up with these guidelines and worked them through the CPT RUC process and 160 medical professional societies from every corner of the country. And I was one of those dozen people on that committee trying to come up with these new and improved guidelines. Having failed to improve the old documentation guidelines for the past 20 years, from the time they were created in 1995, 1996, people have been complaining about them and there has never previously been a successful opportunity to change them. So the biggest change is the total utter simplification. No longer do you have to have any elements of history. You don't need to pass family social history. You don't need a complete review of systems. You don't need any physical exam. You get to choose your visit level based on solely the medical decision-making or your time, total time on the calendar day. And when the public health emergency emerged, CMS knew they wanted to adopt these guidelines they have to go through the federal rulemaking process. So they couldn't tell until the very last minute in the final rule, yes, it's gonna happen. But in anticipation of their intent, they made billing for telemedicine all across the country, time-based on the calendar day, total time, calendar midnight to calendar midnight to get, to get everybody used to this type of coding in anticipation of this day. The time standards are easy to remember. It's 15 minute increments for the new office visits and 10 minutes for the follow-up office visits. 15, 30, 45, or 60 minutes are the thresholds for the new five le four levels of office visits. And for the established office visits, it's 10, 20, 30, or 40 minutes, which means if it's a really easy, simple, nothing visit, and your patient needs to talk to you and you like your patient and you wanna answer their questions and you talk to them for 41 minutes, you get to bill a level five high complexity office visit for those 41 minutes. In fact, if you talk to them for 38 minutes and it takes you three minutes to write the note because the medical part was so simple, you still for that total of 41 minutes get to bill a level five office visit. Now, there are some codes for prolonged services. There's a CPT code 99417, which is listed on the slide. And CMS said, we don't like that. We're going to use our own G code, G2212. I have some slides on that in, in a bit. We'll go through that. I'm advised that, you, in fact, you're using both of these. I don't know what your operations and processes are for reporting them. I'm going to show you what ours are because uh, I'm going to have a, a bunch of screenshots of how our, our EPIC is configured for us. All right, this is the simplified table for medical decision-making. And remember, there's no longer any requirement for any history or any physical exam. You just need to say why the patient is there, follow-up of blank, new visit for X, and what your, is your decision-making or what's your time? That's it, all the other history and exam, it's for good patient care, it's for knowing what happened at the last visit, the next time you see the patient, it's for informing and communicating with your colleagues and other people, it's for malpractice issues, but it has nothing to do with picking the level. It's this single simplified grid for people who recognized and understood the old documentation guidelines for office visits, it's gonna look very familiar because you've got three big columns there for the presenting problems, the amount of data in the middle and the risk to the patient on the right. But 
No longer is it um, uh, uh, a point system for the number of problems. No longer is it a point system for the amount of data. It's this single table. And as soon as you get two of these three boxes on a single row, that tells you what your visit is. Two boxes of three on a single row. So let's take a deep dive into each of these three rows, the low, medium, and high complexity office visits, the 992132142152. and 215. We're not gonna talk at all about a 99211 because that's a non-physician, non-advanced practitioner visit. That is a nurse visit for a blood pressure check, a glucose pulse ox check. That, that's a nurse visit where no provider sees the patient. A level two visit I'm not gonna spend any time on because it's wave therapy. All right, chief residents, what's wave therapy? Exactly, you have great chief residents. It's, hi, how you doing? It's a wave to the patient, you physically saw them. That's the minimum threshold for the level two visit. As soon as they have a question, problem, symptom, sign, anything, you're at a level three visit. So I'm not gonna spend any time on wave therapy. Here's your level three visit. We're gonna start off, let's talk about the data. So there's two categories here, category one and category two. And as soon as you fulfill either one of these categories, you have enough data. So you need two of these three boxes, you're halfway home to level three visit. You'll note there, there's low risk to the patient and the box is empty because if you don't do anything to the patient, there's low risk to them. So as soon as you have a patient that you're not doing anything for, and either category one or category two, you have a level three visit. Now it shouldn't be named category one and category two. It's really a misnomer. It should be category one A and category one B, because as you will see on the next two slides, that category two assessment requiring an independent historian will become a bullet point in category one, and there'll be a different category two and category three. It will merge. You'll see that on the next two slides. Category, so what is category two, an independent historian? That is information from anyone other than the patient. That's their spouse, their bed partner, their roommate, their cousin, the grocer, their pharmacist. You talk to anybody to verify one little piece of information, you have credit from that independent historian. What's category one, tests and documents? So there's three bullet points there external notes, that means notes from outside your provider group. Meaning if a general internist wants to look at a gastroenterology note, they just need to say, looked at the GI note from last week and here's one little thing that I gleaned. What you glean may be no change in meds for Crohn's disease. That, that's all you need. You don't need to import the note. You don't have to wax poetic like Tolstoy. Two, three, five words is all you need. Now, if you look at five GI notes, you still get credit for just one note because multiple notes from the same group are considered as one unit. But if you look at a GI note and a note at a, at a pulmonary note from some other institution through Care Everywhere, that, that's two notes. Care Everywhere is your highway to other information from elsewhere. Uh, another of these bullet points is reviewing the result of a unique test. Now, the result of a test that somebody else ordered, because if you order the test, the expectation is you're gonna follow up the result. So you get all that credit at the time of ordering, which is the next bullet point. But you can't get double credit like the old system. The old system, if I order a blood count today or a chest X-ray today, you get it sometime in the next few weeks, and I look at the result at the next visit, I would get credit then also, no more. You order it, you get credit at the time of ordering. But again, care everywhere or studies ordered by other physicians, you get full credit for those. And you can mix and match. It doesn't need to be two notes. It doesn't need to be two orders. It could be one result and one order, or it could be one note and one result. So level three visit, I honestly don't see um, anyone in a department of medicine billing anything less than a level three visit ever. And the vast majority of patients who are coming in for a problem are gonna be level four 
or level five. The level threes, even in general internal medicine with a relatively healthy population, as soon as you have two problems, you're gonna be at a level four visit because here at level three, you can see one stable chronic illness or one acute uncomplicated illness, any sign, any symptom, you're, you're at a level three visit. As soon as you have two, you, you're at level four. All right, here's level four. So let's start off again with the data and you can see that bullet point with the red arrow, assessment from that independent historian has now moved up for category one. We have three categories and you only need one of the three categories, just one. You'll see for the level five, you need two of these three categories. But let's go through what the other categories are. Category two is an independent interpretation of the test. That means just like the old system, you look at the spun UA, you look at the abdominal KUB, you look at one slice of the 400 slice MRV gram of the brain. You, just, you, you don't need to read it to the level of the radiologist, you just need to read it to the extent that yes, you can see there's no lesion there, or yes, you can see there's a big lesion in the cerebellum representing the metastatic disease. That's all you need to do. You don't need to import a screen and a half of the full radiology report. Head CT reviewed, I see the cerebellar net. That's it, five words. Discussion of management or interpretation. Or, uh, so what is that? That's the hallway conversation. That's me walking past the gastroenterologist saying, I saw your patient last week with the chronic cough and you said, you don't think it's due to reflux. I agree, it's not reflux. I think they have cough variant asthma. It's the inbox message, it's the email, it's the text. It's all forms of asynchronous communication outside of the medical record. It is not me asking the gastroenterologist, you know, what do you think of X waiting for that GI visit next week and then reading in their note what the answer is. Any form of asynchronous communication. And you just need one of those three categories for a level four visit. So when we take a look left at what are the presenting problems, two or more means you just need two chronic stable illnesses. Two illnesses, just one of these categories. So for somebody with chronic cough, gastroesophageal reflux, and cough variant asthma, I, I have two or more diagnoses. And I looked at the barium swallow, and I see they have minimal reflux. I now have a level four visit in about 10 words. That's, that's all you need. I also want to spend a second talking about an undiagnosed new problem with an uncertain prognosis. If a patient comes to you with a new symptom or you do a physical exam, because patients do like being examined and you find an abnormal sign, if you don't know what it is and you're working it up, it's an undiagnosed new problem with an uncertain prognosis. So as soon as somebody has a complaint, you find something wrong and you order two tests, you win, it's a level four visit. What's the definition of a unique test? I forgot to mention that. It's defined by a CPT code. So if you order a blood count and a chem panel, that's two tests. If you order a basic metabolic panel, right, set of electrolytes, and a set of LFTs, it's one test because you can take LFTs and electrolytes and add them together to get a complete metabolic panel. So there is a single unifying CPT code that subsumes both. But when Lynn or I order a full set of PFTs with spirometry, diffusing capacity and lung volumes, that's three separate CPT codes. That single set of complete pulmonary function tests gives us our three separate orders. All right, we've talked about presenting problems, amount of data, and now let's talk about moderate risk to the patient. Those of you who remember the old guidelines, the first bullet point is a trip down memory lane. It's our old friend prescription drug management. You don't need to prescribe a new drug. You don't need to change a drug. You don't need to change the dose. You don't even have to enter another prescription. All you need to do is say, continue PRN albuterol. That's it. You get credit 
for prescription drug management, just like in the old system. Decisions regarding surgery, with or without risk factors. The definition of major or minor surgery is in the general discussion. There, there is no fixed definition. And similarly, there is no master list. There is no ACP guideline that these are qualifying risk factors. It's what you think is a risk factor for your patient and that procedure on this day. It's not like you have to go to some guideline. It's what you think is important for that patient that, makes, that does or does not make it a risk factor. Now, how about uh, social determinants? Well, finally, all those social determinants that affect our patient's care is now credited here. What are the social determinants? Again, there's not a uniform list. I can tell you that for three years in a row now, there have been presentations at the ICD-10 Coordination and Maintenance Committee trying to expand the limited number of social determinant ICD-10 codes to make it a more comprehensive list. But everything that you could imagine is gonna be credited here. If they missed their last visit because they couldn't arrange transportation, if they couldn't get their prescription filled because they couldn't afford the copay or because the pharmacy benefit manager uh, denied the prescription saying, you gotta get a, one of our preferred meds on the formulary. All of those things count. If somebody in the family was sick and they are the primary caretaker and that's why they didn't get their CT scan or their diagnostic echo, that all those social determinants now count as moderate risk to the patient, level four office visit, and you only need two of these three boxes. So it's so easy to get to a level four visit. I don't see very many level threes in the department at all. I, I think level four is gonna wind up being the, the baseline. And then how do we get to the level five visit? I'm gonna show you lots of examples in the subsequent slides. So data in the middle, just like we did on the last slide for level four, except instead of needing one of the categories, you now need two of the categories. You need a bunch of orders, tests, or notes reviewed, and either looking at an image yourself for study, or alternatively, talking with a colleague, inboxing with a colleague, asking a question of a colleague. How about high risk to the patient? Well, once again, Trip down memory lane, drug therapy requiring intensive monitoring, just like the old system. All the things that used to count, diuretics, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and checking a K for high or low potassium is monitoring for toxicity. The level of any drug, DIG, theophylline, amikacin, VANC, all of that. Checking an EKG for any and every QT prolonging agent that we use, that all counts. The slight nuance in the new system is the monitoring needs to be at least every three months, which means you can order it now to be drawn, done, checked anytime in the next three months, or you can take advantage of the metabolic panel that has the potassium ordered for other reasons by someone else in the past three months to say their potassium last week was okay, continue that diuretic ACE or ARB. That counts. People say it's harder to get to a level five visit because they focus on the left-hand box, the presenting problem, where it has to be a chronic illness with a severe exacerbation, progression, or side effect, or an acute illness posing a threat to life or bodily function. So if you bump somebody's diuretics and their creatinine jumps from 1.4 to 3.2, that is now a threat to their kidney function. The oncologists say, oh, so every patient with metastatic cancer, no. We all have patients with metastatic cancer who live for months or years and, and do fine, or they're getting treatment for their metastatic cancer. That's not a chronic illness with a severe exacerbation. The emphasis is on the severe exacerbation. So when they present with leg weakness, and you're sending them for the emergent MR to make sure they don't have cord compression, now we're talking about a potential severe exacerbation. 
So it's a little bit harder to get to a level five visit uh, based on the, the presenting problem. But on the other hand, all those patients on diuretics, all those patients on other medications, all those patients in transplant clinic where you're checking cyclo and TAC levels, all those patients are getting multiple orders, multiple studies and monitored for toxicity. All those patients coming in for their routine chemo visits are getting monitored for their toxicity to make sure you don't have to dose adjust today. Those are all highways to pres preservation of level five visits. Okay, a couple of quick slides about uh, prolonged services. So here's the definition from the final rule from CMS for G2212. And, and there's an argument here, there, there's a debate here. Uh, CPT defined prolonged services as 15 minutes beyond the minimum threshold. So if you remember for 99215, which the threshold is 40 minutes and it could be as long as 54, because if you go 15 minutes beyond that 55th minute, the AMA and CPT said, now that's a prolonged service, you should build prolonged care. CPT said, no, nah. I'm sorry, CMS said, no, nah. we, we don't like that. We want you to go 15 minutes beyond the maximum typical time. So they created this G code, which says an additional 15 minute threshold beyond the maximal time. So here's what that looks like for a new patient visit where it could the level five new patient visit is 45 to 60 minutes. That means you gotta go 15 minutes beyond that um, uh, 60 minute, um, I'm, I'm sorry, it's uh, uh, 60 to 74 minutes. So that means you gotta go 15 minutes beyond 74, 15 and 74 is 89. So you have an 89 minute threshold for that level five visit for the G code. For a level four visit where it's 40 to 54 minutes, you add 15 to 54, you get to that 69 minute threshold. So you've got to remember that 89 and 69 minute threshold for billing prolonged care if you're billing Medicare fee for service, or if you're billing to payers who are recognizing the G code. Some payers, relatively few, are recognizing and paying for 99417. I'm advised that in your area with probably like we do, have more than a hundred different payers with unique rules throughout them. Operationally, you'll have to figure out what's going on with your payers. What is your process? What we've done is we just have one single process using G2, G2212 with that 69 and 89 minute threshold. And I'll show you what our, our system is, is configured like. Now, I have asked if you have the wand turned on and I've been advised the answer is no. When you're in the level of service activity, which all of you should recognize over here, uh, some of you may remember seeing this little magic wand and I don't know if you're a Harry Potter fan and you actually click the magic wand to see what happens, but if you actually click it, this very nice table appears. And it looks a hell of a lot like that grid I just showed you for leveling your office visits. Now, some people love this and use it with every office visit that they see. Uh, some people know the guidelines and how they apply to their particular patient population and practice style. So they don't need to consult it very often, but it's, it's there as a tool if you turn the wand on and it has a all the features that we've talked about and some very nice functionality cause you can click one and one and one or two of this and one of those. And as soon as you get to three here, then the checkbox will disappear for the level four visit because you've now fulfilled, you've got three of those tests or orders or notes in aggregate and you're halfway home to a level four visit. So if you click, yeah, I, I prescribed the drug or I said, continue a current drug, it will tell you, you have a level four visit. And so I'll be using this as a teaching tool when we go through some live notes from our system. And, and I will, will tell you that uh, I heard loud and clear the wonderful grand rounds a couple of weeks ago from Heidi Tweet. And so uh, hearing some of the questions at that time, I did make some modifications and make sure to show you lots of our notes and including some of my own notes because I heard you say to her, well, what, 
what kind of, what do your notes look like? So I'm gonna show you what some of my notes look like. All right, uh, here's a new patient coming in. They got a whole bunch of problems. They're actually showing up in a general internist's practice for uh, moving, moving to the area. And people haven't changed their evil ways, but you can see they've gone and imported from elsewhere two sets of labs. These aren't labs that they ordered because you'll notice and I, when I say these are live notes, these are really live notes in the system that are, have been appropriately hit to be identified. You can see they have a typo. Uh, the labs were not obtained in 2028. The labs were, were obtained in 2020, not 2028. Uh, and you probably will not be getting credit. People are very lenient in their interpretations right now, but you're not gonna get credit for importing these and analysis what you will get credit for is checking two different records, two different notes, because they're representing two notes. But if you order the test, you get credit at the time you order it. If you want credit for interpreting, you need one word of analysis. So instead of importing and taking up all that screen space, all you had to say is chem and CBC from 12820 normal. You don't even have to spell out normal, NL, you'll get credit. But it's not gonna matter very much because we're continuing our sedial, so we have some prescription drug management. When you say monitor electrolytes, who's monitoring it? Because if you're monitoring it, you get credit. If somebody else is monitoring it, you don't get credit. So you gotta be specific as to who's doing the monitoring. And we have a bunch of problems here that are, are being managed. So when we take a look at the coding tool, so here's the decision making, and you'll see the big red arrows up there. There's, there's also a time tab, and there's also an additional E&M tab, and that's where you would enter either 99417 or G2212, as I will show you on some subsequent slides. But we do have those, those two tests there that, that were reviewed, so you see the blue box too. And we've got certainly two or more chronic problems, there were a half dozen, so look in the bottom left, it's prompting you, yes, on the basis of medical decision-making, this is a level four visit. And if you happen to use the tool, it will pre-populate the level of service activity for you. You do, as a, let me go back, in the upper right, have to make sure you've clicked the correct box for this. Is it a new or is this an established patient? This is a new patient presenting a general internal medicine. So a level four visit based on medical decision-making is 45 to 59 minutes. And it's prompting you. It says, okay, we got 99204. We have GT because this is a video visit with the modifier. And you can see we've gone and built uh, some modifier buttons for telephone or video visits in the uh, public health emergency. And this was a telemedicine visit, yes. Just a, a, a whoops, an update uh, per Heidi tweet. We are um, anticipating turning on the wand very shortly. It's in testing phase now, so stay tuned. Great, great. So again, I think people will um, enjoy using it at least to become familiar with the new guidelines because I, I find it very effective and a very useful, very helpful adjunct. Now, since this was a telemedicine visit, uh, the total time was 65 minutes. We've built pull downs that have time ranges. So you can see the circle greater than 54 minutes. And we encourage people to type after the pull down parenthesis exactly how many minutes so that you can do the math. Now we could do the math 65 minus five, okay, 60 minutes. So it must have been 60 minutes directly with the patient and five minutes looking at the chart beforehand and finishing the note after. But instead of doing that math, it's much better to state exactly how many minutes. And since a level five new office visit has that 60 minute threshold, 65 is bigger than 60, you get to report 99205. Now, just as a quick reminder for the telephone only visits with some regulatory sleight of hand, CMS said, we can't allow you to bill us an office visit if it's telephone only. So therefore, and the telephone visits don't pay very much, but we want to provide parity. So when you bill us for the telephone only visits during the emergency, we will pay you twice as much. We're gonna double the RVUs 
and gives you the equivalent of a level two, three, or four office visit. And so part of the reason we have these pull downs is so that we built uh, within Epic uh, claims processing software so that depending on each individual payer's rules, we're leaving the office visits, converting to telephone visits, putting this modifier, that modifier, so we can batch process claims by the thousands or tens of thousands. But if you, are, you have the wand turned on and you click the time tab and you go and enter the 65 minutes for this visit, look at what magic Epic makes for you. They take that level four medical decision-making in the bottom left and they gray it out because they tell you, no, 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 you make it on time for level five, bill level five. It automatically selects whichever is more appropriate, uh, higher decision-making or time and pre-populates the level of service activity, speeding up your day. All right, here's another uh, established patient. I hate this note. Why do I hate this note? because it's full of copy and paste crap that has not been upda updated and is most likely completely irrelevant. And at least in our department, the utter worst are the oncologists because I don't need the details of the chemotherapy and radiation back in 2007 for this breast cancer survivor, right? Put it in the, put it in the text box in the problem list or say, see the nice summary in my office visit in 2011 when they finished their aromatase inhibitor so that you know where to find it. But I don't need to see it in the first seven of 32 screens worth of irrelevant material when I'm trying to figure out what the hell is wrong with my patient? Why did you see him? You know, you're laughing and I'm going click, 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 click. Where is it? Where's today's visit? All right. There are some updates here and they do meet the minimum thresholds. Uh, we're gonna order a PET CT to restage. We've got only three problems being managed because the other ones are all grayed out. They're not actively being managed. You're not gonna get credit for not actively managing. And um, in this particular circumstance, our smart phrase for that batch processing is .cov teledoc. We have to use that for every telemedicine encounter to allow the batch processing. But if you don't use that for a telemedicine encounter and it's a telephone only visit, we can't bill it without knowing how much time did you spend on the telephone. So it's a, an important prompt and at least reminder to our faculty. Now for this particular visit, there, there are two different orders here. Uh, and you'll notice that's still at the level three. Uh, visit, right? Low, low complexity, but we clearly have prescription drug management and we clearly have three problems being managed. So it's a level four visit based on the problems and risk. You don't have to worry about the data credit. And it's just to emphasize you need two of the three boxes on a single row. All right, example three is an established patient visit. This is somebody coming uh, to oncology. They've got lymphoma and they've got recurrent disease. And you'd think, boy, this is a sick patient, right? And they, they failed two prior rounds of chemotherapy. There's your severe progression of a life-threatening illness. There's minimal copy and paste here, and you're ordering a boatload of studies. You're ordering an MR, you're ordering an echo, you're ordering some PFTs, a chest X-ray, they're gonna have a port placed. You've got the total time as 63 minutes, and it can be any breakdown, any combination of looking at the chart and prepping it before, being with the patient, finishing the note, finishing the letter afterward. I have a lot of level four visits that I bill level five because by the time I'm done sending a letter to the outside doc, I've passed that 40 minute threshold. And when we use the coding tool, we can say, okay, we, we have, Plenty of orders, so the blue box for three plus creates the check for moderate. We certainly have high risk for this progressive disease in the bottom left, but we don't have that second box here on the level five high complexity row. We just have prescription drug management because there was no discussion of monitoring for toxicity with the CAR T cell therapy. If they had talked about all the toxicity monitoring, 
that you need to do during, during therapy with CAR T cells, you'd be at level five. A good example of, I know it's a level five visit. You know it's a level five visit. The oncologists think it should be a level five visit, but you gotta put it into the note in accord with the guidelines so that you get credit for, as Lynn mentioned, you wanna be paid fairly for the medically necessary services that you're providing. Your patients are sick, you're providing great care. Your documentation should at least be minimal so that it demonstrates what great care you're providing to those sick patients. But we, we do have an exit here because we're gonna remember that there's a 69 and an 89 minute threshold. So we don't get to prolong care here for this follow-up visit, but we do get that level five visit based on time because it was 63 minutes. All right, level four patient, they have Crohn's disease. This is, this is a well done note, right? It's all black text. There's nothing copied and pasted. Uh, you can see there's a boatload of orders here. Each one of them is an independent individual CPT code. So as soon as you get to three, you're done. It doesn't really matter. And so let's take a look. We have plenty of tests. We've got a uh, chronic illness with an exacerbation. Now you'll notice the difference between the exacerbation at moderate and the exacerbation at high is it is severe. The old system for level four and five was four was mild, five was severe, moderate was somewhere in between, and it was a continuum. And people would argue about is the step threshold, is it a continuum? If it's moderate, you build level four, level five, mild to moderate four, moderate to severe five, no, no more of that. This is a step function. Anything short of severe is level four, moderate. As soon as you say severe, you're at that level five row. No one's questioning your medical judgment. No one's gonna argue with you that no, 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 you say severe, I say moderate, we'll meet in the middle. Your patient, you know that patient, that patient on this day, you think it's severe, it's severe. It's your clinical judgment. Because that's what these guidelines were designed to do, to reestablish and um, uh, strengthen that patient-physician relationship, stop documenting three of these, five of those, 10 of 14 in the complete review systems, and get back to taking good care of the patient and communicating effectively and efficiently. So this was billed as a level five visit. The medical decision-making as it was structured is gonna be level four because we've got plenty of tests and some disease progression, but because the time is beyond that 69th minute, it winds up being level five. So I mean, I've mentioned a couple of highways, right? Care Everywhere is a highway to lots of outside notes and lots of outside studies to look at and interpret. Another highway to level five visits is that monitoring for toxicity. Another highway to level five visits is that 69th minute for prolonged care. And how do you enter prolonged care? Uh, again, whether it's 99417 or G2212, and there are places that are using both based on payers, but it's a very complicated operations flow. Uh, you would enter it in the additional E&M code area of the level of service activity. And you can see it shows up right here. Oops, wrong way. All right, we'll, we'll have a couple more slides about that in a, in a moment or two. Here's another uh, established patient, another GI patient, as, as it were. Uh, they have a bunch of medical problems, as you can see. We have prescription drug management. And so we've got a stable chronic illness. We've got prescription drug management. We've got plenty of tests. It was billed as a level three, somebody who has been successfully intimidated not recognizing it's a level four visit. The medical decision-making, uh, you could argue uh, level three. Oh, I'm sorry, this is level three because there's no tests here. We, uh, and we, we have prescription drug management, but we have just one problem, namely the irritable bowel syndrome. So we have prescription drug management, only one problem, no data, no tests, no notes. So it's a level three visit, but we hit that 30 minute threshold for a level four visit. 
And so that threshold for time works going from level three to level four, the same way it does level four to level five, just different time thresholds. Um, I think we're getting close to the end of the examples and we'll be approaching some Q&A shortly. Uh, this is an established patient with a very complicated presentation for chronic cough. I don't know about your gastroenterologists and pulmonologists, but chronic cough is the bane of our existence. And the patient's coughing and they got sinus disease and reflux and maybe a little bit of lung disease. And you can't tell what they're coughing from because it's maybe from everything, including potentially neurogenic cough. So there's all this analysis here and you're gonna increase to the higher fluticasone formulation of their uh, asthma inhaler and you're gonna add some nasal steroids and you spent exactly 58 minutes with the patient. So we, we've got one test here because you considered and said, no, I don't really need a methacholine challenge here. You've got two or more chronic illnesses with sinus disease, reflux, chronic cough. And so it's coming out as a level four visit. However, it took 99 minutes till you got done going through the chart and generating this long complicated letter to the outside doc about all the work you were trying to do to figure out this chronic cough. So you would go to the additional e &M tab here and you would type G2212, which is what we're using. Not once, not twice, but three times cause for every 15 minute threshold that you cross, you get to bill it again. So you gotta remember the, the threshold, 69 and 89 for established and new patient visits, and then just keep adding 15s. And when you do that, it, it shows up in the level of service activity, right there. Okay, a couple of quick comments about copy and paste. Uh, I was mentioning some of our oncology notes. You were all laughing because it rings true here at home in Madison, right? So here's, here's another one of uh, our notes. And you can see there's a couple of words different at the bottom. And that's just the start of, start of hitting the page down button where it's just all copied and pasted. Okay, there's some new labs here. And you take a look at a note like this, and from a quality and safety perspective, from a medical malpractice perspective, doctor, what the hell did you do for 43 and 63 minutes? This is a level four oncology note in the modern era after January 1, 2021. They're on chemo for their lymphoma. They're doing fine. They have a benign normal exam, the labs were reviewed. I spent 31 minutes. That's a level four note. Now for us dinosaurs who remember what it was like taking care of patients in the eighties and the early 1990s, as Heidi emphasized in her grand rounds two weeks ago, this was the standard. This is what attendings wrote. This is what private practitioners wrote in their charts. And we could have a debate about whether or not it reflected good patient care, but many would say, that's all you need. Now, I'd like to say a, a little more. Yeah, we have a question. Yes, you're awake, it's great. Now, what would you say to people, you know, the complexity of patients being told they're increasing? Like, being a new patient in clinic, isn't it useful to have notes that have a few and a large history of patient information all the relevant Sure, sure. So the question is in this era with increasing patient complexity for the first time when you're meeting a new patient, isn't it better to have a longer note with more of the history and more of the information so it's a complete analysis? So I would say absolutely yes, in my opinion. Another debate that we could have is should it be there in the progress note or should it be entered as a combination of discrete data in the medical history and or problem list with additional information in the text boxes or should it be in that progress note? That, that, that could be a philosophic debate. That could be an operations workflow debate for how you wanna do it internally. I just don't wanna see that same information from your first office visit seven years ago in every progress note, every three months for the past seven years, cause I'm sick and tired of it. And to emphasize how prescient you were asking that question, 
I had planned in the slides, we'd all like to see a little more. Yes, Lynn. But what you're saying is, if you it's fine, good to we all like to review and kind of help us solidify what's going on in the patient in the first note, but in the follow-up note, see my admission note for details of history. That's all you need, right? In fact, I will tell you, I was reminiscing with a patient who I've taken care of for nine years and his daughter, she brings him in his wheelchair. And um, we were talking about what a great job his four children, the home care team, I and a couple other specialists have done keeping him alive for the past. I said, how long have we been seeing each other? We went back to my original note from nine years ago. So it's not that hard to do, especially with Epic. So here's an example of an endocrine note. I know you have you have a meeting. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting close to. Yeah, oh, I have uh, three minutes. All right, so I'm going to actually uh, just end with a couple of my notes. She asked Heidi what her notes look like. Here's my notes. I, I grabbed it from clinic two weeks ago when I was preparing the slides, and you can see there's there's my interval history. Five sentences at the top. They're not even full sentences in the King's English. It's it's short prose. I use a note writer macro because I still examine my patients, as I mentioned earlier, and here's my decision making. I pull in the four diagnoses that I'm using for this particular visit. There's what we're doing for the next three months. It's three lines, and this is a level four visit, whether you do it on decision making because I got prescription drugs and two problems, or you do it based on time because I hit the 31 minute mark. Uh, here's an example of asynchronous communication. It's my inbox message with actually a uh, primary care internist. This is a patient with adrenal leukodystrophy and uh, she, she's probably developing some HEFPEF and we're adjusting her diuretics. This is all you need for the evidence of the asynchronous communication. And so my take home messages are type less, make it currently relevant, document your discussions with colleagues, your reviews of images, the time you spend talking with your patients because the system rewards all of it. And since we're running over, uh, we will open up now for uh, additional questions, not only from the peanut gallery, from those of you on Zoom. And uh, I'm all ears. Thanks again for all your attention and the warm reception I've received. So thank you. That's an awesome talk. And I, I finally feel after 20 years, 25 years, we're making actual progress in the right direction. Um, that is beneficial for patient care and for physician well-being. Um, and we, I think the challenge is adopting the changes, um, which uh, is always a challenge. Um, one question that has come up, uh, what about inpatient yes. billing? Yes, so I can tell you these exact changes are coming to inpatient services. The valuations of the inpatient services from that RUC committee are in process right now. Those recommendations will be forwarded to CMS at the end of January. Then they will go through federal rulemaking and the proposed rule out roughly July 1 and the final rule November 1 of 2022 for implementation on January 1, 2023 assuming everything goes on course, on schedule. But re remember, we live in a democracy and Congress sometimes does unusual things. So who knows what's gonna happen over the next 15 months, but that, that is the timetable for implementation of these guidelines for inpatient services. Until then, we're, we're in two systems, new system for outpatient, old system for inpatient. Um, and there is a question about critical care billing. I will say Scott gave a whole talk yesterday, which we recorded about critical care billing. And so if you're interested, uh, let me know or let Ann Hansen know, and we'll send you the link for the, the critical care talk. We did a whole discussion on that. Um, another question came up is, uh, what about clinic visits with residents and fellows? Oh. How does this apply to that? Okay. So uh, this applies identically to residents, interns, fellows, PGY-1, PGY-11. Medical decision-making is identical, but the time is exactly the same as it has always been because there's no change to the teaching physician rules. If the resident spends 42 minutes and you spend two minutes, 
you're going to bill on medical decision making rather than two minutes. It's the attendings time, whether it's in the office, inpatient, critical care. It's the attendings time, not the trainee time. I have Dodd, then Nizar. Thank you very much. That was great. Finally, I say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see uh, uh, sometimes it is not so efficient as an outpatient, and I spent more than 40 minutes, 50 minutes in the evening time. Yes. So the question is where does the 40, 50 minutes you spend as an outpatient reviewing chart, how does that count? It, it goes in your note. I created a smart phrase with the fewest words I could come up with. I titled it Care Today, and it says, I spent triple asterisk minutes today providing this care. And it's every millisecond that you spend calendar midnight to calendar midnight, prepping the chart beforehand, finishing the note and letter afterward, all that time adds up for today. As soon as you reach that 40 minute threshold, you're at that level five visit. It does affect your workflow. So when I'm finished with clinic, on that day, I will work, and why do all my notes miraculously hit 40, 41, 42, 43 minutes, but rarely in the 50s? Because as soon as I hit 40, 41, 42, I stop, I move on to the next note. Because unless I'm going to get to 69, I'll finish that note tomorrow. I want to finish as many notes today, midnight to midnight, passing that 40-minute threshold. I want to do a, a, a just a blurb on the non face to face for the 40 minutes you spend the day before uh, seeing the patient. Sure. So you you no longer can bill non face to face care the 99358 uh, prolonged care not face to face with the patient on the day of an office visit. You can bill it on other days if you actually read the. Um, uh, the the final rule from CMS from last year, it, it is ambiguously intentionally written about prolonged care not being billable with office visits. The claims processing computers now will process the claim for 99358 with an office visit. If it comes under review, it will not be paid on the same day because that time is supposed to be added to your time on the calendar day, but the days before and the days after should be paid. The difference is that the CPT definitions say uh, routine visits have a little tiny portion of care for the three days before and seven days after the visit. And so from that technical perspective, reviewing the chart the day before shouldn't be counted. Reviewing the chart four or more days before can be counted. But nobody's really paying attention to that, uh, that nuance right now. And then last question from Nizar. Thank you very much, Scott. How, how would you advise to train our provider to go from that inertia to the <laughs> 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 Well, what's the patient? So how do we train our providers from moving from a uh, note bloat to uh, the current. Uh, so change, change is hard, right? Stable systems resist change. That's why they're stable. And uh, everybody's got to make the effort. So one thing we can do is find some of us who learn the guidelines and set a good example. The reason the young people copy and paste and make minimal changes is they're mimicking our bad example. We haven't trained, we have mistrained the entire next generation of physicians. So we got to get them out of our bad habit. But change management is an important part of leadership. It's an important part of informatics. Uh, it, it's an important part of so many aspects of our life. And we've, we've got to line up behind it. You know, part of the reason I make fun of the oncologists is because I've been yelling at them in annual billing compliance lectures for 15 years, stop the madness. They don't pay any attention to me. So um, we're out of time. There's, uh, I know, a lot of questions being generated. I appreciate all of the efforts. This is step one for change management. Um, first is to be aware of what the current rules and guidelines actually are. Um, and so uh, we're, we're on a journey. We're getting there. Yes. So thank it is you a process. All. Yes.
Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone online.